Good afternoon. Childbearing is a big issue in Singapore, right? Parents are concerned. Not just that. Let me just try out my. Uh, what do you want? On. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Babies. Parents are concerned to have babies. But not just parents, grandparents are also concerned. Aunties and uncles are also concerned. And our Singapore government is also very concerned, right? That's why when you have baby bonuses and all this. And sometimes the church people are also very concerned. And you hear of people in the church going to someone, you know, a couple newly wed or something, and quote Genesis 1, 28 to them, says, be fruitful and multiply. You must have children. And sometimes couple themselves feel being judged for being childless. And sometimes couple also feel being judged for having child of a certain gender. This is a quite a difficult issue. If last week in Leviticus chapter 11, if you consider that one of the most misunderstood passage of the Bible regarding food laws, Today's passage will then be considered one of the most controversial passage. And uh, even many Christians sometimes are even embarrassed to talk about this passage. And we have many suggestions from many Christians or um, even scholars who actually consider this passage as irrelevant to us anymore. Because they say this is some old practices of the Jewish people and is have no meaning for us anymore. You agree? Okay, we all agree, then that's the end for today. I don't have to explain anymore. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, of course it's not. Of course it's not. But we do, it will do well if you remember two passages in the Bible, one in Deuteronomy, one in Revelation, that give us a stern warning and says, if anyone adds things to the Bible, God will add to them judgment. On the other hand, if anyone take away things from the Bible, God will take away their gifts of eternal life. This is from Deuteronomy and Revelation. So we better don't take away the passage of the scripture. And if you also remember uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16, it says, all scripture is God breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and so on and so forth. So all scripture includes Leviticus chapter 12. It's all part of all scripture. So you will, will do well if we understand this passage. And, uh, and if we truly understand the principle behind this passage, we'll be so surprised that it is a very useful passage. And in fact, when Moses wrote this passage down, I, I believe it's a very counter-culture passage in his era, in Moses' era. I believe it's also in our era. Yeah, it's totally common, to, uh, it's contrary to common belief about this passage. If you remember chapter 11, let me do a recap of chapter 11. Uh, uh, Elder Gregory preached to that chapter 11, uh, which I, I term it as the most uh, misunderstood passage about food laws. Uh, the laws of our food law was so tedious, so uh, detailed, and in fact, it's costly. We have to throw some of the pots and pans away, and uh, even very awkward to talk about it. Uh, but he taught us what's the principle behind that passage was to dare to live differently from the pagan world. They're telling the Israelites to live differently from the pagan world, that they are, they are in the world that does not believe in the true God of heaven and earth. Why? Because living godly lives is indeed tedious, costly, and even awkward. Because they are living in a godless world or anti-God world. That's what we are. Okay, Because this is the world that we are also living in. Yeah, we add an L-Y to the cause there because there's a spelling error. <clears throat> and, uh, and if chapter 11 is about eating together, then it refers to them, uh, it talks to them about their community life together, their social life together. Then today's passage in chapter 12, it will be about their family life. Can you see the circle narrow a little bit from a social life, community life to now their family life? And it's a very difficult passage. Let us attempt it with prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, as we're going to read your word, your precious word, we believe that God, you have inspired it for a purpose, for our living and for our holiness. 
and we will see the beauty of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ even through this passage. We pray for see wondrous truth. But, so if you thank, uh, uh, you can sit down for reading the passage for us. It's a short passage. Let me just sum up, uh, summarize this passage in this way. If you give birth to a boy, this is a picture of a boy. I, I just randomly take it from the internet. Okay, and, uh, and what are you supposed to do if you have a, give birth to a boy? Let's call this boy T. Okay, give birth to boy T. Then the mother, let's call it Q. Okay, the Q mother it will be considered unclean for seven days and she have been quarantined for 33 days and the boy then have to go for circumcision. That's why I put a scissors there, a circumcision. Okay, if you don't understand what circumcision is, after this uh, service, you can approach uh, uh, Elder Gregory to ask him. Okay, and uh, what happened after that? Then he have offer burnt offering and sin offering. Okay, but if you happen to give birth to a girl, let's call this girl C. Yeah, and uh, then the mother Q will be unclean for 14 days and after that quarantine for 66 days, but there's no circumcision for the girl. Again, the same thing is there will be burnt offering and sin offering to be offered. Yeah, can you see the differences here in this chart here and also the similarities? And these will help us understand the passage better. And... Of course, within this quarantine period, the mother is not supposed to touch anything consecrated or not to go into the sanctuary because she is considered unclean. Okay, this is a confusing passage, but what is this passage about? Before we consider what this passage is about, let us see what this passage is not about. Okay, this passage is not about, number one, Giving birth is a bad thing or an evil thing. No, this is not what the passage is about. Genesis chapter 1, 28 does tell us that God says or commands the first pair of humans to be fruitful and to multiply. And in Psalms 127 says, uh, children are actually gifts from God. So giving birth is not considered evil or bad. Second thing, what is this passage not talking about? This passage is not talking about girls are more inferior. It's more, the girls have to seven day, uh, double the time of quarantine. I'll we'll talk about that later. But let me show you uh, in Genesis again, just a verse before 128 uh, is 127. It says, In the image of God, He created human beings, both male and female. This is a very, very counter culture statement when Moses wrote it down in the uh, ancient world at the time because women in their ancient world were considered mm, inferior. But Moses says, no. But the word of God says, no. The word of God says, man and woman are equal, made in the image of God. Can you see that? They are made in the image of God. And in some of the uh, culture, they probably they also think that only like Pharaoh is like the image of God. But we say, no, any man and any woman are made in the image of God. So it's totally contrary to the thinking of that time and probably to some of the thinking of our time too. So God, the Bible himself, declares men are precious, equal, in, because they are made in the image of God, highly potential to reflect the glory and the holiness of this God of heaven and earth. That's what we are, the image of God. And if you take a look at the context itself here in this passage, at the end of the whole quarantine period, whether you give birth to a boy or a girl, uh, the, the thing that makes the mother clean again is the same sacrifice. So I put here the same burnt offering and sin offering, they have to be offered for a boy or a girl. It, it doesn't mean that the boy offer less and the uh, girl have to offer more. No, it's the same. It's the same uh, uh, offerings that they have to to offer for cleansing of the mother. So the woman or the girl is definitely not inferior. So if it's not about giving birth, that makes one unclean, that makes one sinful, uh, or it's not about a problem of a gender, then we have asked ourselves what this passage is all about. What's the principle behind 
this strange or even some consider as embarrassing passage. Well, we take a look at this. What makes that mother unclean? Take a close look at it. What makes her unclean is not giving birth, neither is it boy or girl. What makes her unclean is the loss of blood. Can you see here in verse 2, she says, she's considered unclean like that of the menstruation period. Of verse 4, that because of the blood of purification, and verse 5 again, it says like that of menstruation. Verse 6 again, it says for purification for blood. And verse 7, so she'll be cleansed from the blood flow. Can you see? So what makes that mother unclean is because there's a loss of blood. Well, why this loss of blood? How to make sense of this loss of blood? Well, if you remember, we have preached it earlier uh, in chapter 2 when there's no eating of blood and the significance of blood in Leviticus and in Genesis is blood signifies. Thank you, right, signifies life. And so giving birth, uh, when the loss of blood, like the menstruation period, they are considered not gaining blood but losing blood. They are not gaining life, but they, in fact, this is a very important lesson to remind the woman at the time. That they remind the woman that when they lost blood, they are considered unclean because it is to remind them of a very important uh, truth. And the truth is this, I put here, of their position in the society, that the women are not safe by childbearing. And it signifies by the loss of blood making them unclean. Women are not saved by childbearing. And why this reminder is so important, if you remember that we have read in Genesis and, uh, and the rest of accounts in the ancient biblical world, ability to give birth makes a woman very important. Makes a woman like feel secure of herself. Makes a woman to find that their identity being a mother or their status different. For example, if you remember uh, a person like, uh, even before, even if they are not married for the woman, they will feel inferior. Like if you re remember the case of Genesis 29, when the case of a person like Leah who was not married. But more than that, when they are able to give birth or when they fail to do so, they, they feel insecure about themselves. You remember that in uh, ancient biblical account of a person like uh, the saga between Sarah and Hagar. Remember that account? And also the competition between Leah and Rachel when see who can give birth to more and uh, the suffering of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Well, if, you, if you put collect, collect all these accounts together, you realize that the ancient biblical world thing, it is a common cultural thinking that when they are able to give birth, they are more worthy. Their status up one level higher. They found their security and identity in it. And I put that, they have found their salvation in childbearing. So, I think when the scripture put here, says you are, when they give birth, they are considered, because when the, when the fact that they will lose blood and considered unclean, God graciously remind them that child giving is good, but they are no better than people who are single, and no better than people who are barren. They remain sinners like anyone else, signified by the loss of blood and consider them unclean. This is a very counter culture of the ancient biblical world. You must understand. You see, God is telling them, I love the males, I love the females, whether they are married, single, or they are fruitful, or they are barren, because they are made in my image. It is God, what is God telling them? So at the time, of and at a time after the fall of human into sin, God reminds the woman that even when you're able to be fruitful, you must understand you are no different from your fellow sinners, whether they are single, whether they are barren, you are no different from them. So I conclude here that motherhood is good, but remember motherhood is only the temporal role that they play. Motherhood is good, but their real status their eternal security is in something even better. And I put here, what is there something better? They are covenant, covenantal people of God. And this is reminded to them by the fact that the boy has to be circumcised on the eight days. And if you remember Genesis chapter 17, what is circumcision all about? 
when God made that covenant with Abraham and God declares that I am your God and you are my people and they are making this covenant together. And this is a real status, not because they are single, not because they're married, not because they are fruitful or they are barren. No, their real status, eternal security should be there because God had made a covenantal relationship with them. And as for the girl, baby girl, they will double the period because the girl is not able to go for circumcision. So that prolonged period is supposed to make the mother think through, meditate on this fact that, yeah, if it's a boy, the, the period will be cut short. But now that the girl, this longer period will cause her to meditate on the fact or to remember the truth that, well, I, I'm no better than any, any people and I'm privileged not because I can give her, because I am a covenant people of God. And they are not safe by, so they are not safe to remind them that they are not safe by childbearing their permanent, final, true security and identity is that they are God's covenant people. And such a status come with a very, very high price. Their true security as God's people come from God's gracious provision. And we see that in verse 6 to verse 8. I put here, Mother, there are something more precious. There's something more precious. And what is the something more precious for them? Verse 6 to verse 8 tells us that when they, after the period of uh, uh, purification, they have to offer two of, uh, sacrifices. And we are not going to go back to the meaning of these sacrifices, but it really sh- uh, the, sh- the short of it is these sacrifices point them that the, by the shedding of the blood of this animal, their sins and their uncleanness will be forgiven, will, will be taken away. This really points to the fact that to the better sacrifice to come. So I put here, the covenant status is bought with a high price, but it's not the shedding of the blood of the animal because this shedding of blood of these animals points to the perfect sacrifice to come. And we all know what is that perfect sacrifice to come in years to uh, come. The f- perfect sacrifice is in the sacrifice of the Son of God himself our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what happened the first Christmas. Let me remind you from Hebrews chapter 10, talking about this, he says, For by a single offering, He, Jesus, has perfected all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to us as the Holy Spirit writes the Old Old Testament. He bears witness to us after saying that, that this is the covenant. Remember, He's making the covenant the relationship that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them in their mind. Then the adds on, I will remember their sins and their lawless, lawless deeds no more. It's only by the act, one final act of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, which is a gracious provision of God, that God purchased man and woman from sin, not because of their ability to bear children. What is some implication for us? Well, there are women, actually not just women. There are women, parents, grandparents, and all these who struggle with barrenness. So if you are a believer, implication is you must understand that your identity, your worth, your security is not in your temporal role as a mother. It's only temporal. You need for this life now. But it's that your true identity, your eternal identity, and your worth is the fact that you have found this covenantal relationship with God as God's child. You are God's child, and therefore you are precious by faith in Jesus. This is a very liberating truth for the singles, for the married women who are barren, actually, because your worth is that you are made in the image of God, you are able to reflect that glorious holiness of this God of heaven and earth. And second, when you put your faith in Him, you are double owned by God, double loved by God when you enter into this covenantal relationship with Him through faith in His Son. Not because you are able to give birth or not. Can you see that? So it's a very liberating truth. But it's also a liberating truth, uh, a showing truth for the women who are able to give birth. 
it reminds them again and again that their preciousness is in their relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not because they are talented, not because they have hold some position in the society, not because of their earning power, not because of their gifts, but because of who you are. A child of God, a creation of God, and a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, last, last week, we just went to see a show where you brought the youth along. We watched this show called Encanto. I think it's one of the best uh, animation show I've ever watched. I encourage everyone, whether young or old, to watch it. Well, in this show, we talk about this. Uh, I'm not going to tell the whole show, uh, don't worry. Uh, so I will spoil you. Uh, I will be a spoiler for you. Okay, but the, basically in this family, everybody has gifts, except the main character, the girl. And she doesn't have any gifts. And the rest of them have some special gifts. You know, by the end of the show, they realize that what holds a family together is not the gift. It's not the ability. What holds a family together is something else, which I'm not going to say. You can watch the show itself. But whatever it is, the last part of the show, there was this song, and the song says, the girl says, you are not your gift. You are precious because of you. And this is what I think is a very biblical understanding. You are not your gift. You are not your gift. In this case, you are not, the girls are not her gift of uh, uh, motherhood. Or if you extend this implication further, you're not a gift of your earning power, of your position in the society, of your abilities and your talents. You're not. You are precious because you are made in the image of God. Because you are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ as a child of God. That's why you are precious. Full stop. You understand? So what does it mean for us to apply this? Number one, do not judge a married woman by her fruitfulness or barrenness. How not to do it? Stop asking questions like, hey, when are you going to have a baby? Uh? When are you going to have a second one? Uh? Oh, you have a girl. When are you going to have a boy? Uh? Oh, you have a boy. When are you going to have a girl? Stop asking these kind of questions. Uh? You know what I mean? Now, ask better questions like what? If you are married, ask them, how are you coping with your marriage? Ask them better questions like this. You get me? Yes. Second application. Treasure and affirm each person especially those the mothers and the women not by their gifts not by their ability to give birth or not how to treasure and affirm them well publicly or privately praise them affirm them when they display godly character this is even more important here. they're shining for Jesus isn't it even more important yeah so I always tell people when they ask me about my wife I tell them oh Esther she's a very loving woman she loves the children. She loves me. She loves her, her, her niece. She loves the kids in the church. I, I always tell her. So I publicly I tell them, this is my wife. So we affirm them of their godly character rather than the ability to give, to, to give birth to children or the ability to do this and do that and all this, ability to cook well or all this. No, no, no. And But if you are not a believer, this is implication for you. You can actually receive this status of a covenantal relationship with God. You can be a child of God too. You can. How? Application one. Well, you have to repent from devaluating yourself or evaluating yourself wrongly. When you begin to value yourself, your security, your identity is found in your gifts or in the fact that you are in a relationship you're married, or you're able to give birth, or you're earning power, your, your looks, no, no, no. You, you, then you are devaluating yourself. You're not merely your gifts. You're more than that. You're deeper than that. Yes. And second, when you depend on that and believe that God has already graciously provided His Son to forgive even that sin of yours of devaluating yourself. I'm going to pause and give a side note here about be fruitful and multiply. I'm going to give a side note here. I think this is one of a very misunderstood verse in the Bible. And uh, a lot of people quote this to one another, especially the married woman. You know, you must be careful when you quote the Old Testament passage because remember the, the, the principle behind uh, us, uh, uh, how we understand the Old Testament, the physical thing, the physical law, the physical uh, people, even this physical command of having children always points to the spiritual principle in the New Testament. Remember that? 
Yeah, including all the all that we are going through in Leviticus. It has a spiritual principle behind this law. What is the principle, spiritual principle behind this law? And I put it simply, I think the principle here is to make disciples for Jesus from generation to generation. I think this is this is what the principle behind. You are supposed to produce so-called Jesus worshiper, Jesus lover from generation to generation. And parents, you can do that faithfully. How? When we disciple our children to know Jesus and to love Jesus and to know the love of Jesus for them. And barren parents or single people, you can also do that, actually. You can fulfill this commandment how, when you disciple the people around you, your, your, your niece, your nephews, your, your, your other people, disciple them to know the love of Jesus for them. You are actually building, bearing, producing more and more people into the kingdom of God. Yeah, such a command is still relevant to whether you're single or you're married. When you're married, whether you're fruitful or you are barren. But on the contrary, some parents who are physically very fruitful, by the way they live, they're actually pushing their children away from God and away from Jesus. When they become so overly focused on money-making, loving the world, living an inconsistent life, they are not making disciples for Jesus. They are actually pushing their children away from Jesus. Can you see? They are actually not fulfilling this commandment to be fruitful and, and, and multiply. So this is a side comment. Uh, but how about couples who have uh, who are married but they refuse to have kids when they can? Uh, that one uh, is a different issue. It's a different issue. That one I will not address here. That one is out of their scope here. Okay? So let me summarize the, today's passage for you. What am I saying here? Well, we must understand from a biblical perspective, well, all women are the same. They're equally precious and glorious in the image of God. Can you see all balance? Whether they are young, old, we have children, or they are we have one child or many children, or they are single or barren, they are the same. You know, and, and Leviticus 12 here really focus on the family life. When chapter 11 focus on the community life, and probably in the next chapter, chapter 13, will zoom in into their personal life. You know, so, and in the creation perspective, this is what's happening. But at the same time, because of the fall into the sin, into sin uh, God reminds the woman here through the blood loss, signifying a physical thing that signifies some spiritual lesson, signifying that they are reminding them that they are still sinners and they are not better off than people who are not married, not better off, and people who are barren. So they are not saved by childbirth. So I put that in the view of sin and the fallen world that we are, and the sin nature that we have, they are not saved by childbirth. They are equally sinful like any other woman. And this part of the circumcision of the boy and the prolonged period for the girl reminds the mother that their identity, their true identity, is not in the role that they play as a mother. The true and eternal identity and status is the fact that they are covenant people of God. Covenant people of God. And these come with a high price, a high price of the sacrifice that they have to be made, pointing to the ultimate sacrifice that will come, which is the high price of the life of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I put the last diagram here. Can you see? At the cross, the, not the blood of the, of the sheep and, and animals, but at the shedding of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, putting the covenantal woman, young, old, married, single, barren, or fruitful, put them in the same uh, uh, equality, that they are equally precious as child of God. You understand this? Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us. We pray that we will think about it deeply and help us to see ourselves from your lens and not from our own lens. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.